So I'm going to walk you guys through the process of getting everything set up, and then you guys are going to publish your data into this unified namespace. Now, the only thing that we probably won't do is we won't organize all the data. We'll have everything in the namespace, but we won't get it organized in a ISA 95 structure because we won't have enough time probably to get to that. But so the whole reason that we're doing this is we want to help organizations achieve the holy grail. Okay, so what is the holy grail? It's a fully integrated business made up of digital factories, right? So that means everything and everyone is plugged into the network. The layers of the business are integrated and they operate based on data and information from all the other layers in real time. Stakeholders know the state of the business in real time and analyze data and information. I'm actually going to talk about this real quick before we move on. Machine learning will predict future outcomes based on past patterns and current state. AI recommends operational adjustments to improve future outcomes and stakeholders execute or not execute recommended operational adjustments. So we're gonna talk about machine learning and AI again and augmented reality. How do those all play into this, right? I mean, when we walk into a plant, a manufacturing facility right now, pretty much anywhere in the world, there we know that they're gonna have PLCs in the facility. We can absolutely 100% guarantee that there's at least one PLC somewhere, okay? Either the OEM put it in the machine or they've done their own installations that where they have PLCs that are essentially gateways sitting on top of all the automation, right? And we could pretty much guarantee that they have HMIs, right? We can guarantee that they have some type of ERP system. So whether that's even just QuickBooks, we can guarantee they have some type of ERP. The other thing we can guarantee is that they got people executing stuff, right? And that's pretty much where it ends, every manufacturer. Here's another thing that we can guarantee. If we walk into the plant knowing what we know, we are never going to come to the conclusion that the business we're viewing is running optimally. In fact, has anyone here ever seen a manufacturer that just blew you out of the water, that they ran so optimally, they were so bleeding edge, they just blew you out of the water? I'd love to hear that example. All right, so I have one example. Actually, I got two. One, one's a manufacturer, though. Uh, number one is Tesla, okay? If you want the gold standard for Industry 4.0, in manufacturing, it is Tesla. Primarily, they got lucky, right? They started building the facilities right at the time Industry 4.0 started happening and IoT technologies existed. But if you walk inside of a Tesla facility, you'll shit yourself, I promise you. It will blow your mind and you'll be like, how, why is it everyone's not doing this? Now, that doesn't mean Tesla didn't have some growing pains. They absolutely did. It was painful. I mean, Elon Musk was living inside his facilities, but Tesla will blow your mind. The other thing that'll blow your mind is if you walk inside of an Amazon distribution center. If you go inside of an Amazon DC, it'll blow your mind. Now, Amazon across the board, I mean, so Tesla and Amazon, they have one thing really in common. Do you have recommendations? Otherwise, understand how Tesla does what it does. Yeah, there's a couple of use cases, but they're not published. Rafi should have seen them. Rafi should have seen the Tesla use case. Well, so Tesla's very, I can get you the Tesla use cases. The Amazon one, we can put the Tesla use cases. In a nutshell, you, what Tesla does is they approach each process as a node. And it contains all the infrastructure that, you know, they treat each production line as its own plant, as its own facility. And it has its own infrastructure that it then publishes into the plant level infrastructure, that they then publish into the enterprise in, infrastructure, that they then plug into the Tesla ecosystem. For those of you who have no experience with machine learning in any way, shape, or form, and you're not artificial intelligence people, let's do a quick definition of machine learning and AI. I know you've heard of it, but understanding what it actually means. So machine learning, okay, is nothing more than writing an algorithm, okay, so you you're essentially write a program or you use existing programs to look at data points over time to identify patterns. So what machine learning can do is when you call it modeling, modeling is the structure. It's I've got all the time series data, I've got my failures, and now I'm gonna ask the model to go ahead and learn. So it's gonna learn from that data and, and the information I gave to it to look for a pattern in the time series data to say, okay, I've now learned what it looks like in the days, weeks, and months leading up to a failure of the bearing. Machine learning is not a pipe dream. Okay, but machine learning is real. It's all around us all day long. Artificial intelligence are neural networks for the most part. They are, there's essentially neural networks 
that replace the decision-making process that we go through. So artificial intelligence for industry is going to consume the predictions of machine learning, many predictions, so not just one, bearing failure, but artificial intelligence will consume many predictions and listen to some and not listen to others in optimal recommended decision. That's what artificial intelligence is going to do in industry. The reason that we are sharing this information with the rest of the industry is because we're mission driven. Most people in my position would not be giving this knowledge away. And most people think I'm crazy for giving it away. That's not my philosophy. I, my philosophy is my mom got murdered when I was a little kid, when I was seven. I grew up dirt ass poor in the Rust Belt where every, all my friends' parents lost all their jobs because in manufacturing jobs went away. And I have decided that my life is going to be about recreating the middle class. So that's why I give this stuff away. And that's why I talk about where I come from. And then just remember, solution driven is this idea that we're going to put in this monolith. And it's really the concept that we're going to approach every project as standalone. When we have a round peg, we're going to try and put it in the square hole. When, so I may have a, a big bin full of problems and not all of them are the same shape as, as my solution, but I'm going to jam it in there and make it fit. Technology driven is that I'm going to use a round hole for a round problem and a square hole for a square problem. I'm going to have minimum requirements to say that anything I use, I mean, think about it right now. We already do this before, before a company will purchase a piece of software, it goes through vetting with their IT group for minimum security requirements. It goes through vetting, right? What we don't vet right now is architecture. We do not vet the technology. Why? Because no one understands it. What titles of person should we be looking for? And I said, there isn't a title. There are, there are a couple of different types of people you want to be talking to, right? We want to, we want to get in front of. Number one, we want to get in front of the floor level champion or the plant level champion who's the visionary. You know, what we're really looking for is the person who's going to quit, the, the engineer, the electrical technician, the SCADA engineer, the person who's going to quit if the company doesn't leverage new technology, right? I mean, if you look at manufacturers, and my apologies to anybody here who works in manufacturing, but the best engineers in the world don't work at manufacturers. You know, basically, they may have started there, but what happens in manufacturing, because it's manufacturing so slow, slow to move, they, you know, the bottom 30% are incompetent and they get fired. The top 30% move on and either start their own company, go to work for integrators, and they get left with the middle 40%. That's who's working at the plant. But they have the people, and I'm not disparaging those people. This is, I mean, I worked in the, this is where I started, and then I worked in many plants. So I don't mean to say that if you still work at a plant, you're a middle 40%. But if you retire from a plant, I can pretty much guarantee you're a middle 40% person. If you've been there for 30 years, you're the person who can go along to get along. You're the one who toes the line. You don't rock the boat too much. That's just an, that's how you succeed in that environment, right? Okay?